This is uh, machine learning in genomics, uh, also known as computational biology, genomes, networks, evolution. And uh, it's all about dissecting the circuitry of human disease, uh, heading to uh, you know, understanding DNA motifs, gene networks, epigenomics, how to manipulate and how to dissect disease circuitry, how to understand disease across multiple phenotypes, deep learning applications in genomics, uh, how to interpret medical records and data integration across many different modalities, how to understand genomes and genes at the single cell level, and then how to carry out mediation analysis and understand how genetic variants act through layers of gene regulation all the way to disease. So that's our goal. Uh, we are first gonna be talking about the course overview, introducing the staff, introducing the students, and responses to the student survey, and then uh, introducing the dichotomy of foundations and frontiers, and then uh, the textbook, the homework, quiz, and also the final project, uh, teams, mentorship, challenges, uh, relevance, originality, achievement, presentation. These are gonna be the criteria that we're gonna be using for the final project, I'll describe all that. Then we're gonna dive into why computational biology, then give an overview of the main modules, and then give a biology primer in the context of this course, introduce the central dogma, and then the layers of gene regulation, and also human genetics and evolution. So let's start with means trivia, intro to the course and the goals, and then course organization and content, homework and quiz, and then project. So uh, I'm Manolis Geras. I'm a professor at CSAIL uh, on the fifth floor of the Dreyfus Tower, whenever I'm allowed to go back to my office. And my research is on computational biology, and I work also at the Broad Institute as an associate member. And my focus uh, in research is on disease mechanism, for which we employ epigenomics and comparative genomics and um, gene circuitry, and of course, machine learning algorithms, statistics, and AI. And we're applying this to cancer, to brain, to understand gene regulation, evolution, and single cell genomics. Uh, Daman, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm here from the Government Innovation Fifth Eleven. Um, most of my prior research interests and my future endeavors are related to applying statistics and computer science to many important problems in healthcare. I've worked in CSAIL for two years prior to this. Um, I've done a lot of various research relating to cancer disparities, telemedicine, uh, the project I did in this class last year was pertaining to gene regulatory networks. Um, I've also worked with synthetic medical data, and most recently this summer I did hospitalizations modeling for COVID-19. Excited to work with everyone. Brian? Hi, everyone. I'm Brian. I'm senior in 6-3. Uh, my main interests are bioinformatics and data science. For this class last year, I worked on a project related to epigenetic clocks, in particular using histone methylation. Um, as a way to predict uh, uh, age. And yeah, I'm excited to work with everyone. Great. So anyway, uh, we are your staff and we're so excited to work with you. So we will each have our own office hours and all of that is on the group, uh, on the Google calendar for the class. So uh, one of the first things that I'll do is I'll actually introduce the website for the class. So if you just go to compbio, dot mit to the u slash six over seven or slash six dot over seven or six dot eight seven eight or eight seven eight without the dot etc it will all take you to the fall 2020 um website so you'll see the same slide that i showed you on the first uh slide today and then if you click on materials you will notice that everything is there <laughs> so we've basically uh, hid nothing from you. Every single future lecture is already there uh, as the slides. We will be updating it as we go, of course. And then all of the video recordings from last fall are there. And um, you know all of the recordings from fall 2018 are also there. And all of the recitation notes are there. And so are the problem sets already posted and then a lot of guidance uh, for your projects. And there will be a lot more on that. And even for your quiz, the study guide, uh, everything is there. So if you like to work in bursts and you want to, I don't know, the first few days of the term, do the whole thing, you can. And that's uh, you know exciting. If not, you can just follow along the base. If you miss out on a lecture or two, you can always go back. It will always, always be there. And then uh, if you look at the course agenda, that's probably the most important handout. 
is basically gives you a feel for what we will be covering in the course. And that's something that you know, we'll be going through uh, today. So I'll come back to that. And um, you also will see the first day survey that 55 of you have already filled in. So if you haven't, please do so. And then you also find a 665 page book uh, with all of the class notes that students like you have compiled before. And um, let's see. This is basically what the book looks like. It's uh, basically uh, all of the slides with uh, all of the stuff that I've been saying around each of the slides organized into modules and chapters. So for those of you who prefer uh, the learning modality of reading through a book and reading a book chapter, I really encourage you to go through this. It sort of really gives you a very thorough overview of everything we're going to be covering in the lecture. You will get a lot more out of the lectures if you check out the slides in advance. So very often we're going to be introducing new topics with a lot of buzzwords that you can look up in advance. I will try to explain everything, but if you've had no exposure in a particular topic, it's not a bad idea to just click on the lecture and then maybe listen to the first 10, 15 minutes, and then based on what you hear and all the buzzwords you don't understand, just go look them up on Wikipedia or, or introductory you know, textbooks and just uh, get exposed to it. This is not meant to surprise you. We're uh, meant to sort of bombard you with knowledge and um, all of that knowledge will hopefully be solidified even more if the lecture is the second time you hear things. So, in terms of uh, the uh, survey, so many of you filled out the survey. You can see here that uh, the two peaks in attendance are from first year grad students and from undergrads, but it's a quite broad distribution across second year students, so sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Uh, a little bit of an MN representation, and then first year grad, second grad, third year grad, four plus, and then additional students from diverse places. The majority of uh, folks here are course six students, so 30%, uh, and then there's six, seven, and seven, so which are the next obvious candidate, and also CISB, HST, uh, MAS, and a lot of uh, additional representation. So it's a very diverse group, and that's exciting. That's, that's what I enjoy about this course every year, especially when students start uh, building teams for their projects. It's very nice to have students of complementary skills and backgrounds but common interests work together in a team because it is an interdisciplinary field and it really makes a difference to work in interdisciplinary teams with complementary skills. Here's the background of everyone in the course. Uh, this is you know, compiled an hour ago. So <laughs> if you filled out your form anytime before 12.30, uh, you're in here. And you can kind of tell by the misalignment of the axis that this was done uh, very recently. So, uh, in terms of background, basically folks are very comfortable with algorithms, very comfortable with programming, and quite comfortable with machine learning. So basically intermediate is the uh, orange bar here, and then programming is skewed to the right. Machine learning is quite balanced, and then algorithm is quite balanced. So don't panic if you're on the left side of this graph. That's okay. We are here to introduce all of these topics. We're going to be covering many different aspects of machine learning. And even if this is your first machine learning class, you are in the right place. If you understand some probabilities, you will be uh, you know, very well suited for the class. If you know little biology, that's perfectly fine. Again, we're going to be introducing the biological topics as we go. But uh, as you build your projects, I think it's nice to sort of find people from different ends of that distribution to combine together in the same teams. In terms of research, uh, the distribution, again, relative to this midpoint of intermediate, is skewed very much to the right. So a lot of people have done advanced research in some topic, and most of you have done no research, no experience in computational biology, either prior or current. And that's perfectly fine. This is exactly what we would expect. It's an exception that people have some exposure to computational biology as they take the course, uh, but for those who do, who do, they can really help their teams. And for those who don't, they can really benefit from all of the exposure of knowledge. So year after year, there are students who have never been before exposed to computational biology, who do publication-worthy 
projects. And these, uh, you will see that we have a series of guidelines for guiding you through that process. In terms of why are people taking the course? Huge chunk for both the machine learning algorithms and computational models, as well as for the biology and the health applications. And that's exactly what I would like to see. So basically compared to the midpoint here, the distribution is hugely skewed to the right, and that should be your primary motivators. To a lower degree, it is for the research project experience, but many students, when they reflect back on the course, they basically mention the research project experience as one of the most rewarding aspects of the course. And then the other topics were to obtain a new position, not a big driver, because your current or upcoming position requires the knowledge, again, not a big driver. And then uh, just browsing, exploring, again, not a big driver. And then <laughs> this is actually very rewarding for a professor. You're not taking this class to fulfill a requirement. You're taking this class because you're actually genuinely interested in the class. And that's extremely rewarding. And I hope you will be rewarded for taking this class. And we will try to make sure that you do. So uh, in terms of attending office hours, uh, folks will quite likely attend all three types of office hours. Slight preference for the professor until you guys realize how awesome your TAs are. And then I think this distribution will be skewed again. Um, in terms of when will the uh, recitations happen, you basically go on the materials, you click on Google Calendar, and this will take you to a Google Calendar, which shows when the lectures are, when the TA office hours are, and when the professor office hours are. So basically, you can see that Brian is holding his office hours at 5 p.m. today. I'm holding mine at 5 p.m. on Thursday. And um, uh, Daman is holding hers at 2 p.m. on Friday. Then we're going to have recitation at 3 p.m. And most Fridays, we're going to have a mentoring session at 4 p.m. I guess it's time to introduce the polls. So uh, let me um, stop sharing. And uh, you guys, check out your chat window. I'm going to be giving you four options. 4 p.m. on Friday works great. 4 p.m. on Friday is tough, but I'll make it. 4 p.m. on Friday is simply impossible. All right, so now let's do a poll and we'll see which option do you prefer. So, of course, only options A, B, and C are valid, but you can vote for um, only one of them. <clears throat> this is great, 38, 40. 41 out of 54, 42, 44. Okay, I have 49 responders and I think I will end the poll. Okay, and then the other thing I will always do is after every poll, I'll try to type in the answers so that uh, as the chat is saved, we have uh, an answer. So it seems that only five people really can't make it on Friday. And I'm really, really sorry for that. But uh, it seems to be the best option. I'm, you know, I have to say that I'm quite flexible. So let's do uh, a few more options. So A, Thursday at 4 p.m. B, Thursday at 5 p.m. C, Friday at 4 p.m. D, Friday at 5 p.m. And I can even do, uh, I don't know, E, Friday at 2 p.m. Okay, so let's uh, relaunch the polling, actually. And now I'm going to do multiple choice. So you can click all of the options that work for you. So feel free to, I mean, actually, not, not feel free, but please vote for all of the options that work for you. Ah, is it possible to have options in the morning for people in different time zones? That's a tough one, but uh, why don't I offer a few options in the morning? That's a good suggestion. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. So let me go back to the student survey. First day survey. The responses. Basically, there are some people on the Pacific time zone as well, so that's why it's tough to, to have it in the morning. Let me see. 
Um, all right, so in terms of answers, we have uh, 25, 28, 32, 32, 30. So pretty equally distributed across all of them. And option C and D seem to be the best with the same number at both 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. So this seems to be winning so far. But um, let's go back to the time zones. Actually, you know what? Let, let me uh, include a few more options. So basically, now A is going to be Friday at 9 a.m. B is going to be Friday at 10. C, Friday at 11. D, Friday at 12. And then E, Friday at 1. Did I really suggest one? No. Okay, so uh, relaunching the polling. Thirty-nine, forty. We have fifty-four people. Come on, you guys. We need like fourteen more responders. All right, that's all I'm gonna get. Uh, so we have twenty-six, eighteen, seventeen, twenty-five, twenty-nine. So Friday at one p.m. seems to also be working, but not quite as much as the current time of Friday at four. What I like about Friday at four is that it's right after recitation, so it's kind of nice there. So I think we're gonna keep Friday at four for now, but at least we've learned how to use polls, which is great. So uh, let's see. And in terms of responses, the other thing I wanted to show you guys um, is, um, oh yeah, the time zone. <laughs> um, there you go. So, um, 36% of the students are currently on campus, and then another 17% uh, are, uh, okay, sorry. So 17% are on campus, 36% are in Boston, but not on campus, and then um, another 15% are on Eastern time uh, outside town. So this is, you know, about 60%, 70% of the distribution. And then uh, there's a few people on mountain time, there's a few people on Pacific time, just a couple. And then there's actually many different responses with uh, China. Uh, there's about five students, I think, from what I counted earlier that are in China. So it's a little tricky, but uh, you know we will probably send another survey. But for now, we'll keep them on Friday at four. And the way that we've organized it is a little asynchronous. So you don't have to physically be there. I see another two chats in the window. So let's see, chat, chat, chat. Friday five was equally voted. Yeah, so Friday five was equal. So I'm happy to do Friday at five. I just feel that um, given that it was the same number, um, it's, it's hard to argue for switching. But I'm also very happy to do Friday at five. I know that some of the CISB students have lectures at 5 p.m. So I'm, I'm trying to avoid the 5 p.m. time slot, uh, but we, we probably will send another doodle poll. We will probably send a doodle poll to everyone with uh, options, additional options, and we'll, we'll go from there. All right, so now let's uh, go and um, look at what is the response when people are asked if they're currently doing research computation biology. So about 32% of the people said no, like strongly no. And, uh, you know, another few people said strongly yes. And then uh, there's a, you know, these are some of the responses. So basically, uh, you know, I'll leave it there for you guys. And uh, it's, uh, you know, very diverse types of research projects, which is very exciting because some of those might actually build into very nice sort of bases for building more projects. And then in terms of why people are getting the course, again, this is extremely uh, motivating to see uh, all of you guys uh, with different goals and aspirations, which is really great. So uh, again, I'm gonna leave this there for you guys to read. And then uh, previous years I've asked what are people's interests in specific topics? And then this is what people tend to respond. So 
it gives you an idea of sort of what people's interests are. I felt that this was too much uh, for before you even uh, start the class. So again, uh, lectures are gonna be one to 2.30, unfortunately not in a room, but on Zoom. And then recitations are gonna be Friday at 3 p.m. And then TA of these hours, we're gonna you know, uh, do as we just discussed. And then uh, all of the information is gonna be in the course website and the Google Calendar is uh, public. And you can add it just by searching 647 lectures or just clicking through uh, the poll. So you um, also experienced two types of polls, basically which option do you prefer, single choice and multiple choice. So uh, this is what we just did. And then um, very often are you, uh, I'm gonna be asking you, how well are you following so far? And then you can answer, you know, super well, you know, medium well, kind of in the middle, not so well, not at all. And then how is the pace so far? I'll be asking you that as well. If it's way too fast, just right, or way too slow. And then, I'm sorry, but part of my personality is that I'm like, who's excited? Because I'm just so excited about all this material. And then, uh, I don't know, if you want to make me feel better, you just say super excited. Uh, but if you want to be honest, you say yawn and anywhere in between. Uh, thanks for the applause, Ari. This is also <laughs> very encouraging. Um, and then uh, I'm, after, after different sections, I might be asking uh, who feels that they've learned something. And then again, you know, five means awesome. I learned some new stuff. It was important. I got the intuition. Four is, yeah, this was interesting and possibly useful. And then three is, sure, I solidified some knowledge I already had, but it's still helpful. And then two is like, eh, not really. I kind of knew the stuff already, not much new here. And one is like, nope, I don't really see why the professor is so excited. Uh, and, and that's okay too. But you know, notice all of these polls are completely anonymous. So in contrast to lecture and class, where I basically say who's following and everybody's raising their hand because they feel free of pressure, this is really a chance to be honest and say, uh, no, I actually have no idea what you're talking about. And that's okay because all of the polls are anonymous. All right, so what are our goals for the term? So first of all, uh, the goal is to introduce you to the knowledge, the field of computational biology. So uh, understand fundamental problems in computational biology, understand algorithmic and machine learning techniques for data science. Basically, I think that, uh, you know, as the field of machine learning is getting more and more interdisciplinary, applied machine learning is really recognized as a hugely important field. And there's no better place in my view, and again, I'm of course hugely biased, than computational biology for this, or sort of genomics and health more generally, because A, it has a huge impact on the human condition and you can cure lives, you can sort of save people's well-beings and livelihoods, um, but also you can test and validate the predictions and sort of, because it's not just some abstract kind of thing, you can kind of, go back and actually do an experiment and find out if the machine learning algorithm was right or, or wrong. But anything that we're gonna be learning about sort of applied data science applies very broadly to any kind of um, application field, whether it's, I don't know, social networks, transportation, economics, um, you know, um, many, many different aspects involve the same type of understanding the data set, parsing the data set, writing algorithms that sort of, um, you know, process and understand and interpret the data and then making predictions about the field of interest and then interpreting these predictions, in our case, biologically, but in other cases, economically, sociologically, et cetera. We're also gonna be focusing on research directions for actually becoming active participants in the field. This, you're, you're, you're in a very special position because this is a very young field. It's not like, I don't know, physics where, a lot of the stuff was worked out, I don't know, 100 years ago. It's, it's a living, breathing field. And very often, I'll tell you about techniques that were invented, you know, in the last few years, in some cases by students in my group, or in some cases, students like you taking the class actually invented some of the techniques that we're actually going to be discussing in class. So this class has evolved by incorporating activity across the field, but also activity within the walls of campus. And uh, I think it's, it's extremely um, rewarding to see your projects become part of that knowledge. And then we're also gonna be focusing on understanding how the methods work. Very rarely, I mean, actually never, 
Are we going to tell you, hey, go on that website, type in your sequence, and then you know, see what comes out? Uh, we're going to be focusing on writing code that understands and interprets these data sets and focusing on how the methods are actually working so that we empower you to then develop and invent the next generation of these methods. So that's the men's part. So uh, let's see if I have men's manus. Uh, nope, <laughs> manus. Um, so the so you know MIT is all about men's and manus, right? Men's is the mind, and then manus is the hand. So the manus part is understand how to do research, actually carrying out research. So the problem sets are going to be introducing you to either programming or algorithmic uh, thinking. The programming assignments will give you hands-on experience with real data sets, and we're porting them into Jupyter no Notebooks right now so that you uh, sort of can submit your responses as a notebook, which are extremely valuable if you haven't used them before, and I think most of you have. Uh, again, going back to the survey, um, if you look at uh, there. Jupyter Notebooks. So uh, the peak is in very comfortable or expert, and then there's very few people who have never used them, and you guys will love them and really enjoy learning that. So that's something that uh, we're building on. Um, so, so uh, and then lastly, the final project experience, uh, where you propose and you carry out an independent original research project, and then you present your findings in conference format, both written and oral. And in my view, this is you know, one of the most important things that you can do. Whether you've done research before or not, I think the experience of going through an entire research project with peer feedback, with proposal, with review, with mid-course report, with final uh, written and oral presentations, all of that uh, is an extremely valuable experience. It's usually span, it usually spans many, many months or years in the course of your master's or PhD. Right now, it's condensed into 14 weeks of a course, so it's, it's going to be intense, but uh, extremely rewarding. All right, so now let's talk about the course content. So I like to think of the course as having two dualities. The first duality, uh, you can think of it along the x-axis, is on one hand computation, on the other hand biology. So we're going to be looking at important and relevant current biological problems. This is not biology-inspired problems. And then we just do a bunch of computation on something that we were inspired by biology. And then in the, in the end, it has no impact on biology. We are going to be focusing on having an impact on human health, an impact on biology. And that means that everything we do is going to be on important, relevant, and current problems. The second axis, is the second sort of aspect of this first axis, is fundamental computer science. So we're going to be learning very general techniques and principles of computer science and data science and machine learning. So if you look at the set of uh, lectures uh, from the syllabus, you basically, oops, not, not this one, but the agenda. You basically see that at every lecture, we basically introduce a new type of computational technique. So uh, on Thursday, we're going to be talking about dynamic programming. We're going to be talking about hashing in rapid string search. We're going to be learning about hidden markup models, about expectation maximization, and um, you know, Gibbs sampling, and clustering, and classification, and k-means, and Bayesian inference, and uh, you know, so many different aspects of uh, you know, deep learning, and singular value decomposition, and PCA, and diffusion kernels, and convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. So all of these things are pervasive in machine learning and computer science, and these are things that you will be able to then take and apply to many other places. So that's on the uh, computer science uh, aspect, so general techniques and general principles, not just some esoteric uh, little things, but very uh, broadly applicable. So that's the, the first axis. On the X, you basically have both biology and computer science. The y-axis is the second duality, it's foundations and frontiers. The foundations is basically well-defined problems and general methodology, these are the classics. And the frontiers are complex, current problems and open questions where we often will combine multiple of the techniques that we've learned and these will open up to projects and research directions. So every module is gonna to try to have both a frontiers and a foundation component 
And of course, every lecture is going to have to have both a biological and a computational aspect. So what are the modules? So every module corresponds to an active area of research. So every course is organized in a different way. Some courses are organized around the methodologies. In this course, we're organizing around the applications. So, but the methodologies themselves are going to be building as we go. So we're going to introduce dynamic programming here, and then we're going to build on it there. And we're going to introduce clustering and classification and k-means and Bayesian inference there, and we're going to build on it as we go further, and so on and so forth. So we're basically going to be building up as we go through the computational path, but we're also going to be walking through effectively the central dogma of biology as we work, work through the applications. So we're going to be looking at DNA first, and we're going to be looking at RNA and gene regulation, and we're going to be looking at networks and then genetics and uh, you know, evolution and um, then uh, sort of research frontiers and foundations. So basically, uh, this, the progression of the course is going to be guided by both, by both axes. Um, so first, we're going to introduce uh, thematically the field of comparative genomics, aligning and modeling genomes, dynamic programming, and gene market models. And we're going to be talking about genes and transcripts and RNA sequencing and clustering and structures. We're going to be talking about uh, regulation uh, and uh, epigenomics. So uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about that later this lecture. Transcription factors, motifs, network inference. We're going to be talking about variation, like human genetic variation, and introduce human genetics, human history, heritability, expression, quantitative trait loci. We're going to be talking about evolution and phylogeny and evolutionary signatures, whole genome duplication, genome assembly, and then talk about frontier, basically personal genomics, disease genomics, 3D genomes, and then uh, all kinds of um, you know, very recent topics. So for every module, the first half is going to be the foundations, and that's where we're going to learn about dynamic programming, string matching, hashing, HMMs, expected characterization, give sampling, clustering, classification, feature selection, support vector machines, conditional random fields, complex free grammars, phylogenetics, gene and species trees, evolutionary models, genome-wide association studies, and disease mapping. So all of these are going to be computational techniques. And then the second half is going to be frontiers uh, for each of these fields that are sort of current research directions such as missing heritability, chromatin regulation, recent human selection, uh, network inference and analysis, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the overview of the course in those modules and then in these lectures. And uh, every problem set is going to be associated with a different module. And again, you can do these problem sets concurrently to sort of really help you uh, learn as you go, uh, as you learn each of the lectures. And if you find that you need something in advance, well, you can just Play the lecture from the from the previous year, so that's going to be on one uh, hand, and on the other side, we're going to be doing project milestones as we go through, and I'll give you a lot more detail on those. And then at the end of the five modules, we're going to have a quiz, uh, and then after that quiz, no more P sets, and in fact, uh, all of that is going to be focusing on just finalizing your final project. In terms of textbooks, there's three textbooks that we really recommend. On one hand, for machine learning pattern classification, for algorithms, bioinformatics algorithms, and then for computer biology, biological sequence analysis. So this is focusing more on the genomics aspect. Uh, and then this is more broad machine learning. Many of these books are on PDF online, so you can uh, you know, find them. But in addition, we've basically compiled this book from uh, past years of the course. And then uh, it's available for free again on the website, so you can download it and uh, read it. And um, um, you know, something that we've done in previous years is scribing. Uh, for now, we feel that the course notes are in good enough shape that we don't have any scribing assignments anymore. But if any of you are interested in improving the class notes, uh, we can replace one of the problem sets at your will with um, a scribing assignment. And we, we still have a little bit of work on some of the lectures. So uh, email the TAs if you'd like to replace one of the problem sets with a scribing assignment, and then we'll uh, give you scribing assignments. Okay. So again, uh, there's a you know, Dropbox folder with all of the lectures in there, and then you can uh, edit them, and the TAs can share that with you. 
Uh, and as you know, all of the lectures are already online. So if you go to the course website, you will be able to see that um, the, there's a playlist with a YouTube channel. And um, actually, I'm using all the wrong words. It's a YouTube playlist um, with all of the lecture notes, uh, the lecture from previous years. So you can see here all of the lectures from last year and just click on any of them. If you're wondering, hmm, should I stay in this class or should I go? You can just play ahead and decide for yourselves if you're interested in the topics that we're gonna be covering. Again, we're not here to trick you or surprise you. We're here to help you learn. Um, so there's also a Google form that you can use, provide feedback on the lecture. Um, we can you know, give you more information on that. And then in terms of homeworks and quizzes, so, uh, as I mentioned, every problem will be emphasizing one lecture or two lectures, and there's going to be practical problems where you gain experience in specific techniques, where you write code, you download data sets, and you carry out analysis, you interpret your result, you learn about the behavior of a problem or a method, and then there's going to be some theoretical problems where you're going to be solving them with pen and paper, exploring either algorithmic or statistical or machine learning aspects in more detail and depth, and there might be some additional advanced problems for 6, 8, 7, 8. And then the homeworks are going to be due Mondays at 11.59 p.m. And in terms of late policy, again, we're flexible. We're not here to get you. If you give or take a few hours, that's fine. But if it's, you know, many, many hours later, just let us know in advance. Hey, I have a big deadline that day. Can I have a, another day or something like that? And then we'll typically be fine with, with that. And uh, please submit your homeworks online from the Stellar page. And we won't distribute solutions, but if you've solved them, you'll know that you've uh, you know, solved them. So you'll figure it out as you, as you see them. For the in-class quiz, uh, again, we call it a little quiz. It's not a midterm, it's not a final exam, it's a quiz. It's friendly, it's fun, it's interesting, it's cute, it's fuzzy. And the goal is for you to demonstrate mastery of the material in the four modules to understand the key points emphasizing lecture to understand the subtleties revealed in the p-sets, and to apply your new skills to solve practical problems. Um, it's funny, we were actually discussing with the TAs, hey, should we just like get rid of the problem sets? Should we just get rid of the quiz? What should we do? And they were like, you know what, when I was taking this class, it really helped me to stress out about a quiz because I kind of sat down and studied the material and you approach the whole class in a different way if you know you're gonna be quizzed. So <laughs> I, um, I'm not here to get you. But turns out that quizzing people and having problem sets actually helps you learn. And that's my goal. My goal is to help you learn. So that's what we're gonna be doing. And we're gonna have the problem sets and the quizzes just to help you learn. And eventually you guys will be totally self-motivated and you won't need that anymore. But for now, and I, you know, I, I still haven't hit that stage, but at some point in your lives, you'll hit that stage. And then you'll be like, I don't need quizzes. I can just study for myself and that's fine. And we'll abolish quizzes altogether. Uh, in terms of the types of questions for the quiz, we're going to have some knowledge questions, which are going to be true, false, justify, or multiple choice. We're going to have some deeper understanding questions, which are going to be short answers, and some practical problems where we're going to work through simple algorithms and solve them. And we're also going to have a design problem, or maybe one, more than one, um, but most likely just one, where your goal will be to design a new or modified algorithm, and you'll need both the knowledge and, you know, a new idea, and then argue that it solves things correctly. As for the final project, the goal is for you to do original research in computational biology. So a major aspect of the course is gonna to be to prepare you for original research in computational biology, how to frame a biological problem computation, how to gather the relevant literature and data sets, how to solve it using new algorithms and new machine learning techniques, and how to then go back to the biological realm and interpret the results biologically. So that procedure is what data science is all about. You always have to frame the applied problem, gather the relevant data, solve it computationally, that's where you walk to the theoretical side, and then interpret the results practically on the applied problem at hand. So again, there's no better application of that than you know, genomics and machine learning for computational biology, in my view, for sort of this applied data science and machine learning. Uh, another huge aspect is going to be the ability to present your ideas and research. So what I always like to tell my students is if, you know, kind of like they say, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, has it really fallen? If you do the most awesome research in the world, you basically solve a hugely important problem. 
but your paper is impenetrable. No one can understand what you did or no one can get past the first three horribly written paragraphs, then your impact is dramatically diminished. You know, having an impact means actually impacting people, actually changing their thinking, changing their understanding of the world. And if you can't convey the thing that you've learned, it, it doesn't have impact. So that ability to present your ideas and your research, uh, we're gonna be, uh, you know, this is unfortunately underdeveloped throughout our classes at MIT. There's a, only a, a small set of classes that are, that are currently doing this. And this is one of them where you're gonna have to craft a research proposal and that's gonna be very helpful for fellowships and grants. You're gonna have to work in teams of complementary skill sets and that's hugely important in this current interdisciplinary world that we live in. You're actually going to carry out reviews of your peer proposals, identify flaws and suggest improvements. You can be like, hey, your data set here doesn't seem to be there, it doesn't seem to be working, or you know, this algorithm is not very well suited for this problem, and suggest improvements for, you know, hey, maybe you should just that, that other algorithm work here, you need a different data set. And that actually is extremely rewarding. I always feel like, oh, why are we doing this to the students? And it turns out that year after year, the students are like, wow, this was one of the most important aspects. Thinking critically about the um, you know, proposal or the project of another team helped me, is what the students always say, it helped me understand my own project critically or it gave me ideas about how I could present my project or ideas about how I could sort of solve a new thing or you know, how to, like basically you learn so much from peer review. And uh, you know, also learning how to receive feedback and how to revise your proposal according to this feedback is extremely important. And then of course, writing up your results in a scientific paper is extremely important. What I always like to say is that every student, a paper, every, every time a student completes a paper from beginning all the way to end, and even all the way to revisions and final publication, they learn something so intangible about this whole process that is not just the sum of the parts, it's really seeing the whole thing come together. And it's only when you've gone all the way to the end of it that you kind of learn how to tackle the project from the beginning the next time around. And I think that, that completing all of that in one term is very important. So writing up your, reser your results and then presenting a research talk to a scientific audience. And I also have a lecture, as you will notice, even in the um, you know, playlist on how to present uh, papers, figures, and presentations. And this uh, is a huge amount of advice that you can use to basically uh, build up your presentation skills. And again, we'll get there uh, eventually at the end of the course. So this term project mirrors this uh, process that you constantly have to go through in life. And um, in terms of milestones, um, we basically created a series of milestones and we asked you, how much guidance would you like for each part of the term project? And again, it's extremely rewarding to see your answers. So, you know, I was thinking that many people would say, ah, just prefer no guidance, just let, let us be, we'll do it. But no, for, project topics and previous examples for you know, creating the proposal for, uh, let, let me go back to the survey here. Um, yeah, for forming a team with complementary skills. People want a lot of guidance. Writing a strong and feasible proposal. The more guidance, the better. Demonstrating an initial end-to-end -end pipeline. The more guidance, the better. And then it's kind of interesting. It kind of falls off as you go to the end of mid-course report the more guidance, the better. And then final report, yeah, it's still that distribution, but not as crazy skewed. And then final slides in our presentation, again, people are like, you know, sure milestones and deliverable will help me, et cetera. So anyway, again, uh, you know, we've been planning this, but seeing you respond this way is very satisfactory because it's like, okay, we're not, we're not off the cuff here. We're not, sure, we're not off the ball or what do they call it? Um, we're on the ball, there you go. So this is the term, 
these are all of the days of this semester. So basically the last day of classes, I think is on the 9th or December or maybe the 8th of December, but our last day is on the 8th of December. And then this is Columbus break. And then this is Thanksgiving break. And then that was uh, Red Day. Oh, and of course, sorry, this is Labor Day, September 7th. But we have basically, you know, 15 weeks ahead of us. And the project is organized with milestones along these 15 weeks. So round one is gonna be practice. Basically create a self-introduction video and fill out a form, which you already have, and submit it by Friday. So basically, you know, week one on Friday, we're gonna ask you to build a self-introduction video. And what that entails is um, in the, I'm gonna be sharing this Google Doc with you guys. So it's gonna be one massive Google Doc that basically walks you through all of the rounds of the project. So basically for every round, we're gonna have uh, a lot of advice. So for week one, the self-introduction, given the online only nature of the course this year, we would like each student to pre-record an introductory video presenting, not parenting, presenting themselves and their background to the rest of the students in the class and to the teaching staff. So tell us about your background, your interest, your education experience this far, what computer science and machine learning techniques you've used, something about previous research projects you've done, what you're looking to gain out of this course, what topics you're the most excited about, why you're excited to be part of this program, why your future career goals, yeah, what, what they are after this course. And then you can click and upload the video here. So if you click that, you will notice that there's a Dropbox link. And then you can just drag and drop the file or add it directly from your Dropbox. And it will magically appear uh, as long as you name it uh, correctly. So please name it uh, first name, last name, intro video dot mp4 or something. Okay. Um, then make sure you also fill out the self-introductory uh, survey, basically the first, the first day survey uh, here. And you know, again, most of you have already filled this out, but if you haven't, please do so. And then this will be used to introduce yourself to the rest of your classmates. Uh, there's also um, out the free form um, self-introduction. Um, so, you know, please, uh, and, and we'll, the template is actually already there. So template, um, copy link address. Okay, so fill out this template. And then if you look at the profiles from previous years, um, for, there you go. So in fall 2019, for example, these are uh, the student profiles. So basically, Every student basically says a little bit about their academic background, their previous research experience, the area that interests them the most, and the preferred type of project. And again, speaking with the TAs, they were like, wow, I definitely went through these files to basically find partners. And when you find these partners, you can just email them and text them and say, hey, I noticed that we have complementary skills and common interests. Let's work together. And uh, please do that. So, um, you know, we'll compile them all together and then um, share them with the rest of the class. Again, we'll be sending you a lot more emails about that. So that's um, for uh, week one. Then week two, we're gonna be looking at uh, literature search and paper. So basically next week, we're asking you to select a paper in nature, nature biotech, nature genetics, science, cell, some fancy high profile journal and make sure there's an abundant data set there with cool code and analysis. And then your assignment is gonna to be to describe the topic, the background, the overview, and the importance and goal and the achievement of the paper. Describe the data sets that are available and their organization. Describe the algorithmic and machine learning techniques used in that paper. Describe the code availability and how easily replicable the results appear to be because if they're easily replicated, they're also easily extended. And you can basically build on that data set and build on another data set and build on a third data set or sort of build a method that sort of combines across them or combine methodologies from different papers. That's really the best way to start on a new project. Basically find a paper 
that has already compiled the data sets. I don't want you to say, oh, I'm going to look at the, imp at the impact of, I don't know, environmental pollution on human health in pregnancy. Uh, yeah, great. That sounds great. Where are you going to find the data? So then you're going to spend, you know, three, four weeks searching for the data, and then you're going to realize the data is not available, and then you're going to look for another project. If instead you start thinking from papers that are already there, from combinations of papers uh, that are already there, it really makes things much more concrete and much more likely to succeed. So, um, and then we'd like to have both a written and a tabulated description. And again, that's for week two. I'm going to send you more details about that um, of that paper and also create another three to five minute video presentation where any student who's interested in that paper can then go and click and sort of hear you present that paper and we're going to make all of these available. And then you can record yourself using Zoom, using Screen Recorder, using other tools and you know, feel free to let us know of other tools and we'll, we'll use them there. And then again, uh, you know, first name, last name, paper presentation, .mp4, and then just upload them in this link here, which um, is going to be the same thing. Previous present paper presentation. This is a self-introduction video. So for each of those milestones, there will be some kind of upload so that by the end of the term, you feel so comfortable doing these video uploads that it's going to be like, oh, term project, no problem. We've got this. Okay. Then we're going to be asking students to score their interest in the previous papers as potential topics. Then we're going to be asking each one of you to list their top three ideas. And uh, that's going to be the third week by, you know, Friday the 18th. Then we're going to be building teams and uh, create some initial project proposal. So basically, based on the initial papers, everyone will have access to all these papers and the corresponding data set. So it might give you ideas about how to combine these papers in different ways. It's going to be building a resource that all of you will use. And that's round two. Round three is going to be listing your top three ideas from all of that. And all of that is going to be again available in the whole for the whole class. And then by week four, we're hoping the matchmaking will happen and we're going to have mentoring sessions with breakout rooms throughout this process so that you can find each other and can chat with each other. And then hopefully by then you have already teams formed and an initial proposal. By week five on Friday, we're going to actually have a peer review of these initial proposals. So on September 25, you're going to be submitting your proposal and you're going to have one week to review your peer proposals. And then you're going to be submitting your reviews on the following Friday. And then you're going to have one week to incorporate those reviews into your revised proposals. And by then we're kind of, you know, um, set. We basically know that the project is very likely to work. But the last step after that, after this week six, is going to be a week seven of an initial end-to-end -end pipeline. What does that mean? That basically means demonstrate that you have all of the needed data sets and all of the needed code and all of the components are in place and you can load them up into your computer and that they're all working. Because if you can't, you might have to revise your project. So yes, by then you've had a peer review and you responded and you've revised your proposals and you've, you know, downloaded all the data sets, but then having a demo where you record yourself on your screen, basically saying, okay, here's this data set and here's that thing. And I can load the data there and I can reproduce, I don't know, figure, figure three or something. I think that's sort of the initial end-to-end -end pipeline. That's what I mean by that. And that's round seven, and that's you in week seven. So remember, this is mirroring the amount of feedback that you guys have actually requested. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we're not, uh, you know, off the mark here. We're, uh, we're sort of responding to your needs. But after that, week seven, we kind of let you be, okay? And then the only next milestone is going to be week 11. So four weeks later is going to be the mid-course report. And then the goal of the mid-course report is to basically demonstrate that you can kind of see the end of the tunnel in your final project. That basically you're like, okay, I have all of the parts in place and I, I, I have done a lot of exploratory analysis over these first four weeks. Now, starting you know, week 11 Friday, so starting November 13, 
this is all about wrapping up. And then the goal of wrapping up is basically say, these are the figures that I would like to have in my project. And this is what I'm going to put in those figures and how I'm going to do this. And that gives you until basically December 4th to complete your, um, your projects. And then the final report is going to be uh, week 14 uh, on Friday. And then the final presentations are going to be, again, recorded asynchronously and then due on uh, the last day of class or maybe the day before the last day of class. So we can do one final round of peer review where everyone in the class will actually score every one of the projects. And this is, you know, um, very educational. It basically makes sure that every person in their own free time watches every presentation. And it's something that we always cram to do live in the class. And now we're going to be doing it asynchronously. Everybody's going to be re recording it. So there's not going to be any connection problems. And everybody's going to be watching them. And to know that you've watched them, we will ask you to actually score all of them according to some criteria. All right. So here, time for the, for the next poll of how well are you following so far? Who's with me so far? All right, so uh, 33,900. And then the next poll is going to be, um, how's the pace so far? Am I going too slowly? Am I going too fast? Am I going just right? You guys are so fast with these polls. It's great. Nice. All right, so uh, 38 just right, and then two above and three below. And then um, the last thing is, who is excited about all that? Remember, that's the part where you make me feel good? <laughs> this is awesome. I hope you're not just doing it to make me feel good. Um, awesome. So good. I'm so excited, too. So uh, 25, 11, 4, 1, 0. Um, good. So I'm excited. You're excited. And this is you guys. This is, uh, you know, um, I'm so, so happy to have so many of you here and to have so many bright, excited young folks ready to sort of tackle research and become the next generation of computational biologists. So make an effort to meet your peers. We will have profiles for everyone. We will have video recordings from everyone. Get to know each other. Um, you know, we're going to have team building sessions where you're going to have breakout rooms by topic of interest and have a chance to chat. I'm going to be walking between the different rooms. So will your TAs. My goal is to overcome the distance between us and to really form friendships, to really get to know each other, to get to know your interests, to get to know your background, your aspirations, your goals, your, you know, research background, your, you know, career future, um, you know, plans and all of that, just get to know each other. And uh, let's, let's really embrace the fact that technology can still allow us to come together, even though we're not physically together. And, uh, you know, let's do this, okay? So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the milestones ensure sufficient planning and feedback, setting up, building a team, getting inspiration, building proposals, and, oh, and by the way, I've also made available uh, the uh, previous projects from last year. So you can see the slides from fall 2019, the videos from fall 2019, the individual slides and final reports, example projects, uh, you know, individual final slides and reports from 2018, 2019, 2017, even from the spring course from this past semester. So you can see that you're not alone in this. You can see that, you know, sort of what kind of projects other people have accomplished. And many of these students never had any background in computational biology before that. And yet they're able to, uh, you know, create all these awesome projects. And I hope you will too. All right. So uh, we're also going to have some interaction with the communication lab to basically help communicate your research results, to basically give you feedback. So uh, this is, you know, uh, feedback from previous folks who have used it. And this is how people use the Comlab. And again, this is not going to be in person anymore. It's going to be in, on Zoom. 
but um, you know, we are excited to sort of have the Comm Lab work with us for many years now to sort of give students feedback. Um, all right, so putting it together all together, uh, we have, uh, oops, that's my family, grading. So this is the grading rubric that we came up with. And um, this is roughly how much time we expect you to spend on every part of the class. So this is how we came up with the points as well. So problem sets, we expect you to, to spend about uh, five hours a week for the first six weeks, uh, or six hours a week for the first five weeks. Um, sorry, six hours per problem set for the first five problem set, but each of them is gonna be two weeks, so about two and a half hours a week. And then for the quiz, we expect you to spend about 10 hours cramming and studying for the quiz. But again, uh, understanding the lectures, you know, we expect you to spend about another hour after lecture for each lecture, or you know, this can be half an hour before reading the slides or skimming the slides and half an hour after reviewing material, et cetera. Uh, and all of that, of course, will go into your quiz as well. Um, and then we expect you to spend you know, 30 minutes on your self-intro, two hours on your uh, previous paper presentation. Uh, so selecting the paper, reading the paper, and then presenting the data set. And then maybe one hour listing your top three ideas, maybe 20 minutes per idea. And then this big chunk is about your final project. So uh, we expect you to spend about three and a half hours on, you know, after you've selected your idea on sort of writing your proposal, one and a half hours on sort of making your initial pipeline and your video, and three hours on making your report, uh, mid first report, two hours on making your final slides, two hours on uh, recording your final presentation, and then four hours writing your final report, and maybe six hours across the different rounds of peer reviewing. But again, this is not the only time you're gonna spend on the project. I, we expect you to spend a total of 30 hours actually working on your projects through the course. And um, attending mentoring sessions, we're planning to have about seven mentoring sessions, each of them for about 30 minutes or an hour, so maybe another seven hours there. And then um, attending the lectures, one and a half hours times 24 lectures, 36 hours there. Attending recitations, one hour times 14 recitations, another 14 hours there. So a total of 175 hours and uh, 12, 12 and a half hours uh, per week. So it's a 12 unit course. Um, I hope this, this will fit well. So, and then in terms of points, uh, again, why are we having points? To trick you into learning <laughs> in order to earn points. It's gamification of learning. Um, we're not here to get you, we're here to help you learn. So uh, the P sets are gonna be worth 20 points and then the quiz is gonna be worth 30 points. Self-intro, two points. Paper presentation, seven points. Top three ideas, five points. The proposal itself is gonna be 10 points. The final report, 15 points. And the peer reviewing, 10 points. And then each of your initial pipeline, mid course report, final slides, and final presentation is going to be five points. But again, all of these together will culminate into about 55 points, which is comparable to if you add up the P sets and the quiz, which is also comparable in terms of the total number of hours that you're spending. Uh, here, all of the project uh, related components spend 50 hours, and then another, uh, you know, 50 hours for the rest, basically. All right, so let's see who's following so far. Okay. So uh, 35510. Uh, great. So that's the course overview. So hopefully by now you have a pretty clear idea about what's, what this course entails. So now let me spend the next 10, 15 minutes on why computational biology, what makes our field unique, give an overview of the, of the main modules, and then a quick primer on biology. So why computational biology? So uh, this is a question that I've asked year after year, and there's many, many different types of answers. So in fact, let's use the chat function so that all of you guys can enter an answer. So um, 
I'm going to stop sharing, go to the chat, and say, why computational biology? What makes it different from, I don't know, computational astronomy or computational geology or computational social sciences? Why, why is computational biology so exciting? Now it's time to type your answers. Or you can just raise your hand, or you can just like unmute yourself and give answers. Biology is big, awesome. It is big, and um, it's data rich in a historically data poor domain. That's very cool. Potential to do whatever you want without waiting for experiments. That's brilliant. DNA is a massive data set, awesome. More efficient and in-depth way to explore biology. There's tons of biological data sets waiting to be analyzed because you can use other people's data sets and get a good research done on the budget. That's great. More and more sequencing data coming out it might be the biggest frontier of computing today. That's great. New technologies and lots of data. Totally agree. Biology benefits from approximation. Very nice. The need to integrate multi-omics data to gain more insights. That's great. It's interesting and new, of course. Can use expertise from other engineering fields to impact health. Great. Complex patterns of biological data impact human, real human lives, important applications. That's awesome. Answers questions not easily solvable, but traditional experimental biology. That's very true. It's not just that experiments are slow. It's that experiments can't even answer some of these things. This is fantastic. It expands our horizons in asking biological questions. Brilliant. This is so cool. Keep going, guys. This is amazing. So if you haven't typed one in, just go for it. And a big shout out to all the folks who responded. Wendy, Matthew, Stuti, Pablo, Lily, Hugh, Ari, Erez, Evelyn, Manu, Thomas, Kathleen, Daniel, Swathi, Farhan, Lucy, Andrew, and Dylan. You guys are the best. This is awesome. So yeah, wow. Um, online uh, is actually sometimes working better. So these are the answers from previous years. Uh, so you know, there's lots of data and also combinations of data. There's rules, uh, and that's kind of very cool about biology, the fact that there are underlying rules. There's, uh, it's all about pattern finding, it's all about data, the ability to visualize the data, to simulate and create temporal relationships, to guess and verify, to gen generate hypotheses, to guide the experimental testing, to propose mechanisms and theory to explain the observations, uh, to understand combinations of variable related to these times, lots of data here. Also efficiency, reducing the experimental space to cover quite rapidly, understanding that there's a huge need for infrastructure and the ability to combine data sets relies on that infrastructure, build correlations in higher order relationships, and then the cycle from hypothesis generation to testing is getting dramatically condensed. And the, my favorite is that life itself is digital. We're basically trying to use computation to understand a digital computer that runs inside all of our cells. I always like to say that humans are not the inventors of the first digital computer, we're the descendants of the first digital computer. That in fact, every one of our cells has a digital code at its core, and of course, tons of analog running around it, but life itself is digital. It's a DNA code, it's zeros and ones all the way down, which I think makes computational biology so, so unique and so different from every other field. And that's what these zeros and ones look like. It's basically, you know, A, C, G, and T. And within this A, C, G, and T lies data. The, you know, these data have meaning. This is actually real data. This is an actual genome. This is the genome of Baker's yeast. For any of you who has either uh, drank wine or beer or had a slice of bread before, that's the genome that you've consumed, that, whose product you've consumed. So ATG is the start of every protein coding gene. TAG, TAA, and TGA is the end of every protein coding gene. And that's how every gene starts and ends, and that's how genes are encoded. And in between those genes lie regulatory motifs. These are the controllers of gene expression. These are the stoplights and start lights that turn genes on and off. You can see here different motifs for this region of the yeast genome. This GGGGT in you know, the forward strand is TGGGG, and on the back strand is CCCCA, which is actually the same thing as here, CCCCA. 
So when you start reading DNA, you'll realize that you can read it in both directions as long as you reverse complement it with G matching a C and A matching a T. Here's another motif, CGG, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 nucleotides from CCG. Why 11 nucleotides? Because every um, turn of the double helix is actually 10.5 nucleotides. So that basically means that these guys are sitting on the same side of the DNA, facing on the same direction where the protein will bind, but have a full turn of the helix. And there's another CGG, 11, CCG. CGG, 11, CCG. That uh, homo um, dimer is basically a palindromic motif. It's a motif that's the same forward or reverse because that factor binds as a, you know, two, two pieces that are stuck together and sort of bind there. And then the Tata box uh, read again in both ways, TA, TAA, forward, or TA, TAA for the other gene on that side over there, okay? This is kind of cool, right? Like you're basically learning how to read genomes and you're learning about the pieces of the functional elements that are in there. But of course, I'm, I'm giving you the answer. The answer is actually hard to find out. The yeast genome is super, super simple. It's, you know, 70% protein coding. But if I ask you to look for all the protein coding genes and all you know is that they start with an ATG, you're going to find a lot of ATGs. Knowing which ones of those ATGs are real protein coding genes is hard. And that's the challenge of extracting signal from noise. So a lot of what we're going to be learning this term is ways to extract meaning from these genomes. And the meaning that we're going to be extracting is going to have to do with all of these building blocks of genomes. So basically, these motifs that I showed you are sitting in the middle of promoter regions, which are proximal regulatory regions, and enhancer regions, which are distal regulatory regions. And both of them are made from combinations of these motifs. And these enhancers loop around to bind promoters, which then recruits the machinery necessary to turn on transcription of any one gene. But there's additional motifs that are acting to splice uh, mRNAs together into exons that code for proteins, and then introns that are spliced out and not included in the final mRNA product. And additional motifs that guide splicing here, or motifs that guide the degradation, translation, and stability of the RNA message, including by microRNAs. So these are the building blocks and they're put together into circuits and groups. So what are the modules that we're gonna be learning? What we're gonna be doing is basically going through all of the different aspects of how to analyze genomes, basically how to find the genes in the genomes, how to align genomes across species, how to assemble genomes together, how to search a gene in a database really, really fast how to compare species as a way to understand the patterns of evolution and the evolutionary signatures that allow you to distinguish different classes of functional elements and to also distinguish functional from non-functional regions. We're gonna be studying the evolutionary patterns of these genomes and how to analyze the expression of the mRNA that gets made from these genes. And we're gonna be building matrices of gene expression patterns of thousands of genes across thousands of conditions to discover clusters of genes within there and to discover motifs associated with these clusters. We're gonna be putting all of these genes into networks and understanding their emerging network properties and how genetic variants affect those. So in the first module, we're gonna focus on aligning and modeling genomes and sort of look at foundational techniques of dynamic programming for alignment and hidden markup models. We're gonna be looking at uh, gene expression analysis and Bayesian inference for clustering and classification of uh, these expression patterns. We're going to be looking at um, how to discover regulatory motifs, how to discover these recurrent patterns, and how to model uh, information within them uh, with specific assumptions. We're going to be looking at expectation maximization for inferring where the motifs are starting and with what the motif patterns are in a loop. We're going to be looking at hidden Markov models for parsing genomes, for understanding their meaning and function, and for even interpreting their epigenome, their uh, circuitry. 
and we're going to be looking at um, the evolutionary patterns of those genomes through phylogenetics and phylogenomics, how to build you know, trees of their evolutionary patterns. And then we're going to be looking at the disease aspect of uh, how are genetic variants on the x-axis here associated on the y-axis with different disease phenotypes. There are thousands of genetic variants associated with each of hundreds of disorders. There's more than 120,000 loci that are known to be associated with disease, but for very few of them do we actually understand their function. So what we're going to be focusing on is how do we use all of these techniques for understanding genomes at the service of human disease understanding and how we can exploit the evolutionary patterns of different regions to recognize genes based on their patterns of evolution and how we can um, use these to, to basically understand uh, the, the, the molecular basis of human disease. So that's, these are going to be the main modules across genomes, gene expression, epigenomics, networks, genetics, evolution, and of course, frontiers. And then whoever needs to sign off can sign off. But for the next few minutes, I'm going to be giving you a very brief biological primer in the context of this course, taking you through the central dogma of molecular biology. So for those of you who already understand all of biology, it's good. For those uh, of you who want a refresher, we're going to be talking about DNA, epigenomics, RNA, protein, and networks. So let's dive right in. So the central dogma of biology is that DNA makes RNA makes protein. And DNA is what I like to call the most noble molecule of our time. It's this double helix that forms the basis of heredity. In their paper in 1953, where Watson and Crick described the structure of the double helix with this figure here, they basically said it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Their key insight was that these very weak hydrogen bonds are holding these massive molecules together. And because they're on the inside, that actually forms the basis for complementarity, that an A can only match with a T and a G can only match with a C. And therefore, if you know one strand, you can infer the other strand, which is used in copying DNA. The chemical details of this base are that the phosphate backbone, which is the strong links that everybody before Watson and Crick were expecting to be in the center of this molecule, are in fact on the outside of this molecule that hold the backbone together. And on the inside are either three hydrogen bonds between strong bases, because they have three bonds, or two because be between weak bases that have two hydrogen bonds. And we can use these to abbreviate the different types of bases based on their field. Uh, the epigenomic landscape modulates this DNA information. So in a prokaryotic cell, uh, you know, DNA is floating around the whole cell. In a eukaryotic cell, DNA is compartmentalized in the nucleus. And you basically fit two meters worth of DNA in every one of your cells. If you take all of the DNA of all of your cells and you stretch it end to end, you will not just go to New York, you will not just go to the moon, you will go to Jupiter and back 10 times with the DNA from a single person on planet Earth. And the reason is that we have trillions of cells and each of our cells has two meters worth of DNA packaged up in this miniature way. And the way that this packaging is possible is through epigenomics, where we have whole chromosomes condensed, where the DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes and these nucleosomes are condensed into chromatin and this chromatin folds and folds and folds. And this is not just structural. This is not just for compression. This is also functional. The epigenomic modifications of these packaging blocks can allow you to encode what type of information lies within each of those. And these modifications can come either at the DNA directly with DNA methylation or at the histone tails with epigenomic modifications that are post-transcriptionally changing these histone proteins that hold DNA together. So 147 bases of DNA are wrapped around each of these nucleosomes, which is made out of eight histone proteins. And every one of those nucleosomes, every one of those histone proteins has a long amino acid tail that can undergo modifications. And that 
is how we can remember that a brain cell is a brain cell and a liver cell is a liver cell. What makes our bodies function, despite all of our cells having exactly, or more or less all of our cells having exactly the same DNA, is that the parts of the DNA that are utilized in different organs and in different cell types are dramatically different from each other. And that epigenetic memory is what results into the diversity of cell types that are forming the human body. So my team has been involved in mapping these systematically and we actually led the human epigenome project which sort of formed the foundation of our epigenomic knowledge uh, right now. And uh, that's continuing through the central dogma, DNA makes RNA makes protein, epigenomics modifies DNA, and then RNA is the most amazing molecule. On one hand, it can be the messenger, where DNA gets copied into RNA before making a protein. However, RNA can also play all kinds of really cool functions. If you look at the structure of RNA, it can fold because it's a one-dimensional, uh, it, it's a one-stranded molecule, not a two-double-stranded molecule, and therefore it can form these double strands between different pieces of the same mo molecule. So here it can fold onto itself, and there it falls onto itself again, and here it falls onto itself, and it can basically create these elaborate structures that are as elaborate as proteins, but as versatile as DNA. And then proteins, of course, are translated from this RNA. We're not gonna be focusing on proteins this much in this course, but they are the, the richest in their structure and in the shapes that they can take. And they're made out of 20 building blocks instead of just four. And these are the different amino acids because they have an amino part and a carboxyl part, and which is an acid part. And then they're translated from the uh, mRNA using these adapter molecules which are tRNAs, and it makes sense that the adapter molecule is an RNA itself because it's a nucleic acid on one side and therefore you can base pair DNA by complementarity in the translation, or you can actually base pair RNA in this particular case, but it can also form structures in three dimensions and therefore recruit specific amino acids which are making that translation. And the specific uh, organization of the genetic code allows us to uh, understand uh, DNA very interestingly. So, uh, of course, these proteins then fold back to regulate RNA and DNA uh, through layers of gene regulation. That's what enables all of the different cell types to be established during early embryo development and then maintained through epigenomics. That's uh, through the folding of the DNA that I mentioned earlier with enhancers, looping together to promoters to create the right conditions for mRNA to be transcribed. And then there's a huge diversity of roles for these regulatory non-coding RNAs that can also contribute to gene regulation. So we're gonna be learning about all of these networks throughout uh, the network part of the class. And then lastly, mutations can act at the DNA level, RNA level, or protein level, and then impact all of these circuitry. And there are billions of letters of DNA, 3.2 billions of letters, but only about 6 million different building blocks of genetic inheritance and only you know, a few hundred thousand uh, genetic variants in the genome, which are associated with differences in phenotype. So a major part of the course is gonna be understanding how to interpret these genetic associations, how to discover them in the first, in the first place, and how to decipher them to understand the mechanism of human disease. How do we go from a disease at the organism level to a mechanism at the molecular level? And genetics is really the power force for doing that. And there are thousands of genetic variants associated with many different types of disorders. And our group uh, and many of our collaborators, and of course many others in the field, have paved the way for understanding these genetic variants through molecular data sets like epigenomics, regulatory genomics, and comparative genomics that we're going to be describing through the course. So that allows us to now start combining together uh, disease associations with the tissues in which they're acting, with the regulators that control them, and understanding how thousands of these genetic variants impact DNA in minute ways, and inferring these circuits, which allows us to then go and reverse these circuits. Our team has also written the first dissection of a non-coding variant all the way down to the nucleotide resolution 
painting the complete circuitry all the way to phenotype. And we can basically show how this one nucleotide change changes the binding of this regulator to this motif, changing a super enhancer, affecting the expression of genes that are 1.2 million nucleotides away, which then affects the process of thermogenesis or lipogenesis to basically switch between fat burning and fat storing in our adipocytes to then lead to a lean or an obese individual. And that allows us to now switch back and forth. And then lastly, all of the complexity that, that you see around you, all of the trees and the forests and the animals and the bees and the bacteria and everything else comes from a common ancestor. All life on earth can be traced back to a single common ancestor. And that actually uh, is you know, unfathomable how much complexity and diversity has arisen from that across all of the kingdoms of life. And uh, we're gonna be studying also that process of evolution through techniques such as phylogenetics, evolutionary models, and phylogenomics. So that's the plan for the course. Uh, lots of modules ahead, lots of material ahead, uh, tons of uh, cool knowledge, cool computational techniques, cool biological applications, and of course, an awesome final project experience that we're so excited to have you all be a part of. So thank you guys for listening. Sorry for running a little over. And then uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you throughout the term and uh, learning so much about you from your videos, from the form you're filling out, and from the mentoring sessions, then forming teams, forming friendships, building projects, and advancing human knowledge of human disease. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.